We are back in 2 Corinthians. Really, chapter 6 starts with the, the first couple of verses in chapter 6 belong to chapter 5, and we've looked at chapter 5. So, as we come to chapter 6, I have to ask a question. Have you ever had a family fight? I mean, a big family fight. Not husband, wife, but we're, we're, we're talking in-laws and aunts and uncles and the like. And then finally, you, you get it chilled down a bit. And so you kind of go over the top on how much we love each other. And uh, I'm so sorry I had to say these things, although they seem to be necessary, but you know, and uh, things are better now. And we're so happy for that, except with some of you. That's Second Corinthians. And really it gets kickstarted in chapter six. The little, um, it always bothers me when people say, well, you're being defensive. Sometimes people can be defensive and they can, they can go overboard in their defensiveness. Paul could be accused of being defensive here. I just don't think that that's accurate. I think if somebody is giving you legitimate response to your criticism, it's not defensiveness. It's just another side of the argument. You opened it. Now they're replying with their opening statement and you can lob it back and forth like a tennis ball until it's sorted uh, or not. But I, the, the whole defensiveness thing, I'm not, not sure we use that word right. Paul says in verse 3, we, we, we just don't put any stumbling blocks in anyone's way. Now that still sounds like he's working on the theme of chapter 5, that ministry of reconciliation that we have all been given. He goes, but we don't put stumbling blocks in any way so that our ministry will not be discredited. Rather, as servants of God, we commend ourselves in every way, uh, in great endurance and troubles, hardships, distresses, in beatings, imprisonments, and riot, in hard work, sleepless nights, and hunger, in purity, understanding, patience, and kindness, in the Holy Spirit, and in sincere love. He's not done in truthful speech and in the power of God with weapons of righteousness in the right hand and in the left oh, coming out there have weapons in both hands through glory and dishonor bad report and good report genuine yet regarded as imposters known yet regarded as unknown dying and yet we live on beaten and yet not killed sorrowful and yet always rejoicing poor yet making many rich having nothing yet possessing everything laying out his credentials and you, you got to be fair he earned every one of those every single one of those and by backwards engineering you can see some of the complaints made against paul they called him an imposter quite a few in that century believed that paul was not a true convert that he didn't come through the regular process you know getting blind and knocked off and down into the dirt on the road to damascus wasn't the way most people came to faith in jesus and then disappearing for years as he did um, he refers to that as being taught by no man but being taught the gospel in arabia then he comes back and there are even people today that uh, look upon paul as an imposter as uh, somehow you know, grabbing the church's power away from Jesus. And, and you can make that case, but only if you let him do it. If you still read Paul through Jesus, well then Paul is a hugely important figure, valuable, inspired, and a great leader. If you read Jesus through Paul, then Paul becomes a despot and rule maker for the new church. So it's really, you know, which way are you reading your scripture? It says we're we've spoken freely to you we're not withholding any affection you know i speak as to my children we've opened our hearts wide to you but you've kept your hearts closed to us open your hearts to us and then he um he speaks a passage that we have misinterpreted so often in the tribes in which i've visited do not be yoked together with unbelievers. For what do righteousness and wickedness have in common? Or what fellowship can light have with darkness? What harmony is there between Christ and Belial? Or what does a believer have in common with an unbeliever? What agreement is there between the temple of God and idols? So, 
how has this been used? When I was a, a boy and growing up in my tribe, you, the, the ministers would not perform a, a wedding uh, of people who were not in the same tribe. If one was in a church of Christ, the other was Baptist, they wouldn't do it. For how, you know, do not be yoked unequally with unbelievers. Well, the problem is that they're, they are believers. And I'm, I'm aware, I'm very aware that let's say a Baptist and a Catholic get married, they're going to face some unique challenges if they are both um, deeply embedded in their, their theologies. There are going to be some real struggles there. And there are going to be struggles about how to raise the children and what to do with holidays. And yes, I understand all of that. But I also believe that there can be love there and there can be grace there and there can be opportunities to serve the other there. Paul isn't talking about marrying here. You've got to go back to 1 Corinthians and realize, well, they were having troubles messing around with idols and messing around with the sexual side of polygamy. And they were, they, they were visiting prostitutes. They were having, and, but doing it in the name of religion because prostitution was a big part of ancient religions in Rome. So he's saying, don't, don't yoke yourself to these unbelievers. Don't run with that crowd. Don't go to their places. Don't do what they do. Because they were, and some people will say, although the NIV does not use the term unequally, some, some versions do. And they'll run to those versions, um, which is their right. And they'll say, well, well, wait a minute. This says unequally. So uh, I'm not sure I get why they can't, you know, be, you know, go with these people here, there, the other. It's because it's never equal. If you're in a group, let's say you're teens, and somebody starts breaking out dad's alcohol and you're not of age, or you've decided not to take it, you know that you are not equally yoked in the room because unbelievers are not okay with you believing what you believe in these instances. I've had atheist friends who are very, very content with the way I believe and that I believe in a God. I've had others that are not, but we're talking about social situations, the pressure of social situations. And by the way, if you're a teen watching this, you need to know, know this, um, <coughs> excuse me, peer pressure never goes away, never. I can go to my mother's assisted living center and see groups, you know, they're, they're pressuring. Well, this, this old guy just wants to sit in his chair and watch some golf. But you know, the, all, the, all of the other patients there, residents are coming, oh, there's a guy playing piano. They got a guy playing piano. You gotta come up here. There's a guy playing piano. Pressure. Paul's saying, pick your group carefully because the groups you're going to be with are going to pressure you either to do good or to do evil. You as the temple of God must decide what group will help you continue to be the temple of God. Doesn't mean you can't be friends with unbelievers. Doesn't mean you can't love them. Doesn't mean you can't invite them into your house. What it does mean is you don't get into situations where they have the majority and the power to pressure you to do wrong. All right, that's all this, this is. And that's certainly sound advice. He goes, we are the temple of the living God, as God has said, I will live with them and walk among them. I will be their God and they will be my people. And by the way, to use this passage to say, well, you're not a member of my church, so I can't do a wedding between you and somebody who is a member of my church is terribly insulting if you use this passage because it, it says one on one side is Christ and on the other side is this demon named Belial. I, don't do that to people. Check your context, all right? And then he goes, come out from among them, be ye separate, touch no unclean thing and I will receive you. By the way, Paul is doing here what he likes to do very well when he reads scripture, uh, which was just the Old Testament at this time. And that is skip around grabbing verses. Um, and again, I've heard a lot of preachers do it. I've done it myself. 
And as long as you're not twisting the context too much, and I use the word too much, because Paul does grab verses that apply to one thing and weave them in to apply to another. I've had people say that's perfectly fine. I've had other people think that that was horrible. I'm gonna let you decide. Uh, I just read Paul for what he's writing. I don't try to uh, attribute motives to it. But come out from among them and be separate, touch no unclean thing and I will receive you, says the Lord. I will be a father to you and you will be my sons and daughters, says the Lord Almighty. He is quoting there out of Isaiah, Ezekiel. He's quoting, um, he's quoting in 2 Samuel. He's quoting in Leviticus. And he weaves them all together. So, what does it mean? It just means that as you go through life, try not to get too dirty. Um, it, take a look at the letter to the elders of the church in Jerusalem in Acts 15 sent out to uh, the churches. And it said... You know, abstain, you know, abstain from the, the blood of food offered to idols and abstain from sexual immorality. It's basically just don't let the world splash its dirt on you. It's, you know, I've heard uh, so many times people say, well, you know, that this TV is just, you know, it's, uh, these TV shows are wooing us. Yes, they are. And so are movies and so are other media. You get to decide where you draw some lines. And some people draw them so tight, they become Amish. Others don't have lines. There's a lot of room in the middle. In chapter 7, he goes, we have these promises. Let's purify ourselves from everything that contaminates us. Now, um, you're never given permission to run about telling others to purify themselves, and you're going to make the list. No, you purify yourself. You know who you are. You know your thoughts. You're, in fact, you're the world expert on what it means to be you. So we do this internally. We cleanse ourselves, body and spirit, perfecting holiness out of reverence for God. Very quickly on the word holiness, it, and I'm, I am being very quick on this because there are great books written on this subject and they are valuable but we're shrinking this just to a minute or two. To be holy means that you profess what you believe and it's, it is toward God and righteousness and the Son of God. And then you live the life of somebody who actually believes what they profess. And so anybody that looks at you can tell what you believe because your speech, the way you use your money, the way you use your voice, the way you use your stuff, the way you treat people in horrible situations and in wonderful situations, all of that is of a whole. You, you aren't a preacher who preaches the love of God and then marches against um, um, Muslims or marches against somebody else. You know, no. Um, by the way, I'm not opposed to all marching. This was a specific instance, right? Uh, there, were, there were preachers, for example, that years ago here in Middle Tennessee rallied together to try to block a mosque being built in Murfreesboro. And their behavior, and the behavior of some people that called themselves Christian, was not holy. Because with their mouth they professed this, but their actions they did this. And we're all guilty. We're all guilty of failing to be holy so Paul says, just keep the renewal going and be holy in our righteousness out of reverence to God. And then he, this family fight comes back in. He goes, make room for us in your hearts. We've wronged no one. We've corrupted no one. We've exploited no one. Which means those were accusations that some in Corinth were still making. He says, I, I, I do not say this to condemn you. I, I've said before that you have such a place in our hearts that we would live or die with you. I've spoken to you with great frankness. I take pride in you. I'm greatly encouraged in all my troubles. My joy knows no bounds. Now, there, there have been periods in history where flowery language just went way over the top. In letters in the 1800s on the American prairie and a, a between loved ones and family in the East, sometimes you, you read it and you're going, wow, was there any adjective 
they did not use? Was, was there any descriptor they didn't use as over the top flowery? I don't think that's what's here. I think Paul had the capacity to disagree with somebody who was actually attacking them at the time and love them enough to live comfortably with them even if they didn't change or to die at their hands. Paul could be a harsh, difficult man, but I believe his capacity for love was far greater than we give him credit for. Because when we came into Macedonia, we had no rest, but we were harassed at every turn, conflicts on the outside, fears within. But God who comforts the downcast comforted us by the coming of Titus, and not only by his coming, but by the comfort you had given him. In other words, we disagree and you're really coming at me, but I want you to know something. I think you're good people. I think you do good things. I think you've got great hearts. I just like to see them opened up a little bit, make some more room for people like Paul, like me. He goes, even though uh, I caused you sorrow by my letter, I do not regret it, though I did regret it. I see that my letter hurt you, but only for a little while. But yet now I'm happy. <laughs> this sounds like making up after a family fight when you're not quite ready to lay down all the weapons. You know, people say, well, it's time to bury the axe. Well, sadly, when we bury the axe, we normally bury it in a well-marked location so we can get it later. And he goes, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm sorry you had sorrow, but I'm happy that the sorrow led you to God and you repented and you weren't harmed. We didn't harm you with the letter. I think some people in Corinth were saying, oh, yes, he did. And I think they were overreacting. Uh, because Paul was just doing what he could do here. By the way, we're still only reading his side. Uh, and there were, we, we truly believe, at least three, almost certainly four books of Corinthians. So we're still only getting half of his mail and none of theirs. But we, you know, Paul's earned a right to get a little grace here. He says, Godly sorrow brings repentance that leads to salvation and leaves no regret, but worldly sorrow brings death. Um, there is the sorrow of the world, which is self-pity, uh, anger, seething, grudge-keeping, and it likes to indulge in revenge fantasies. Now, this is where I find worldly sorrow manifest itself in me most often. I don't think that I have an ounce of self-pity in my, my being, and I hope I never do, because that's the most brutal I, when I ran a counseling practice, I wouldn't work with people that were overwhelmed with self-pity because they were the most powerful person in the world. No matter where they went, everyone had to cater to them. And they weren't going to give that up. Uh, that, that, you know, so I didn't work with that. But I'll catch myself with revenge fantasies. Uh, not violent, usually. Most of them are you know, somebody confronts that person with what they did to me, or somebody uh, confronts that person for what they're doing to others. And I said, not violent. And they went, usually, because frankly, I've caught myself thinking of those, those poor women and children in Afghanistan that are being whipped, hung, stoned, shoved back into their homes, unallowed to come out by these brutal Taliban. I think about the, uh, the, the beautiful little girls of Nigeria that are stolen by uh, you know, this group or the other group, uh, Boko Haram, uh, and forced into sex slavery and the like. I, I, I've, I just, sometimes I catch myself thinking of C-19s or C-130s and delivering either gunships or Marines. Um, and you know, I'm not a pacifist. I think there are times for, um, for action that can turn violent. But here in our lives, most of us were never gonna face anything like this. And these revenge fantasies in our mind show us that we're not whole yet. 
that what we say we believe on the inside we're not quite there so he says let's let's live without regret godly sorrow says I'm terribly sorry and goes to the person if at all possible very much like the steps in AA to make as much amends as you can and then to be willing to for it to take a while for that person to trust you again don't demand instant trust yeah that's something you need to earn and godly sorrow will give you the strength for that journey the other person may be playing with you but you know you'll probably figure that out see that this godly see what this godly sorrow he says look how look at the benefits already we're talking uh, at every point you've proved yourself innocent in this matter even though i wrote to you you know and, and evidently there was some big thing going on in corinth you remember they were suing each other it was awful and so paul's just saying you know the injured party here that party there by all of this we're encouraged because you're opening up you are sorry for what happened in addition he says to our own encouragement we were especially delighted to see how happy Titus was because his spirit has been refreshed, re refreshed, refreshed by all of you. Perhaps it's time for a uh, <clears throat> refreshing beverage. There we go. And he talks about Titus just loves you. And by the way, if Titus loves you, that's good. Because Paul tended to send Titus to the tough places. And then we got we we have time we're going to run forward and we're going to grab chapter eight all right um, he goes now about the collection what happens in chapter eight is this paul is in macedonia a very poor area when they hear of the great need of churches elsewhere and the macedonians want to give to the, the these other churches we have every right there to, to look at them and say no no you, you don't have enough to provide for yourselves. You, you're not required to give at this stage. And yet Paul says not only did they, out of their extreme poverty, they were rich in generosity, giving as much as they were able, verse 3, and even beyond their ability, entirely on their own. Entirely on their own. Preachers never use these passages, as I have heard them used, to harangue a congregation to give more. Don't do that. He says, you do this on your own. In scripture, it is as you have prospered, as you have made a decision, you don't let other people guilt or force you into this. People have been giving to our Safe Harbor Church in increments of $5, $10, um, a bit here, a bit there. And then sometimes a big check comes in and blows us all away and allows us a little bit of breathing room. We can get a little bit more software to go online. We, we, can, uh, we can perhaps hire a worship minister. There's Misha. Or we can, you know, and that's been huge for us. And every Sunday we do ask and say, here's how you can give. But I, you go back over the last nine months, by the time you see this, it'll be 10 months of our existence, and you will find we have never harangued, pressured, or guilted at all. Instead, we have lauded and thanked those who give and told others, if you want to join, here's how. And that's it. I appreciate that when I hear that spirit in churches or on podcasts by people that are making podcasts for uh, this subject, you know, it could be anything, history of rock and roll or the history of Macedonia. And I really appreciate it when they don't go on and on and on about the money. But they just say, listen, it means a lot and it helps us do this if you could take care of this. I, I appreciate that. Anyway, Macedonians are poor, but they gave and they gave and they gave. Um, they gave first to the Lord and then by the will of, of God, he says they've given it uh, more, you know, beyond that to Paul and to us so titus would have been in there uh, perhaps luke is still involved i'm not sure where you know who his companions were at, at this particular point but he said verse 7 since you excel in everything in faith and speech and knowledge and earnest and complete earnestness and the love we have kindled in you see that you also excel in the grace of giving uh, giving was a hard thing for me to learn it really was i grew up 
uh, relatively poor, and we knew we were poor. I don't understand people who say we were poor but didn't know it. I knew it. I was observant. Uh, and a lot of things other kids had we didn't get. Now, parents loved us. We were well supplied. Uh, certainly didn't starve to death. We didn't, uh, we didn't go to school without shoes. I, I don't want to overplay this hand. But I understood that money wasn't much there. And as I entered into uh, marriage early, you know, Cammy was 18 and, and I was 22. Uh, there's four years between us. Well, way too early and we had zero resources. Yet 42 years later, uh, to quote the captain or to Neil, love has kept us together. Um, it's actually been Jesus that's done it, the love of Christ. Uh, that's only, the grace of Christ is the only reason I'm in this place at all. We, we had to learn how to give because I remember our first apartment, we had a borrowed mattress, no bed frame or anything, it was just on the floor, and a, um, a bookshelf and a chair, one chair. That's it. And people say, you know, we look back, but we were happy. We, we were struggling, frankly. And therefore, I always thought that the money I had was barely enough to survive and didn't think in terms of giving. I had to watch other people give and see the sacrifice they made. And I would love to give illustrations, but I've not asked permission from these people, so I won't. But I saw them give to their hurt. And I decided to try. Now, I'm not a prosperity gospel guy. I'm not gonna tell you, you just give till it hurts and God will just pour money from an unexpected, no, no. Um, I've had money from unexpected sources before, but I don't see a cause and effect there. What I see is God supplying so I can give. In fact, Paul even brought up earlier in one of his books we went through, we work so that we can give. That's the purpose. Jesus said, don't lay up treasures, give. We don't, you know, at our safe harbor, by the way, we don't give through super large charities that are multinational because we're not in charge of the money once it leaves our hands. And we don't know who has it. We don't know who takes it and what they do with it. So we work with One Jenner Way, we work with, um, with uh, GraceWorks, and then we also work where you are. If you're a member of our Safe Harbor Church, which you can be, just email me, patrick at rsafeharbor.com. Tell me you want to be, we'll sort that out. Uh, it's, it's easy done and we love it. But if you're a member, and let's say, we, we, I know we have like four or five families in Spokane, Washington. Let's say they have a flood and there are some people there that need help. Whatever they raise, we may be able to match it, but we give to the people we know. We, we help the people on the ground where the money doesn't have to pass through too many hands. Be smart, but giving has enriched my life beyond measure. Uh, when we were fired and we had no income for, for months, that was a really hard thing for me to do, was to go worship without giving a check. And then as soon, the first week we were put on salary, I wrote the check and I said, Cammy, I've written a check to the church. And her eyes got big and she got out of her chair. She said, can I see it? And I showed it to her and it was the same amount, which is a tithe that we were giving before we were fired, but now to a new place. And, and she actually cried. She said, I'm so happy that we can give. Giving's, giving's good, all right? And in, again, no pressure on you though. Verse eight here, I'm not commanding you. No, we wouldn't do that. We'll be friends if a if, if penny never passes between us. You'll be as much friend as if thousands do. Because who am I to tell you what to do? Go on. I want to test the sincerity of your love. He says, uh, here's my judgment about what's best for you in the matter. And verse 10, and I like that. Here's my judgment. The last year you were the first not only to give, but also to have the desire to do so. Now keep that same spirit up. Finish that work. Be givers. Be generous with your time. Be generous with your money, obviously, with your stuff, but be, be a generous person. 
somebody has a story everywhere I go I get people that want to tell me stories and many times they are long disconnected and have nothing to do with anything I will ever need to know but as much as possible I try to hang in there and be generous and hear their story um, it, it's worth it for them and I think it's probably worth it for me too then Titus is being sent to um, to pick up the collection and he's very Paul is very very concerned that you understand they're going to use money wisely he says verse 20 we want to avoid any criticism of the way we administer this liberal gift for we're taking pains to do what is right not only in the eyes of the Lord but also in the eyes of men and we do that as well by the way we um, we pay part-time a man who is an expert in IRS and 501c3s and chief financial officer stuff and the like and he gives us a huge bargain for the amount of work he does for us he has his own job but he he will let us know oh that's a red flag no we don't put money that way no we move this over here yes you can do that that's brilliant and then we have a, a board at our safe harbor that is made up of men who understand money rules law and we are very very open with our people because we want everything to be pristine and not just legal but moral ethical and generous as we can be uh, so they're sending people to them in verse 24 the last uh, verse in chapter 8 therefore show these men the proof of your love and the reason for our pride in you so that the churches can see it he's going to change subject so we're going to leave it at there three chapters today but I like that last wrap up show these men the proof of your love some people talk about love languages and you know there are only two kinds of people in the world people that divide people into two kinds of people that don't so when you do love languages and you give them a set of four or six or eight that's how many people are going to pick so I'm not going to go that way what I'm going to do is this if some you love someone and you tell them that's great now you need to show them but you need to show them in the way they can understand it and receive it and so he's saying show these people the proof of your love so you're not going to just stand there when they come in and go hey we love you you're going to open up your homes you're going to help them if you can give you'll give some more but you will show them grace and kindness you'll feed them that's brilliant I'll wrap it up for it with an example there's a little church in Louisiana that I love actually there are several there that I love and when a hurricane came through and messed up a lot of their wee town uh, the little church there has no money they just don't and so they couldn't give money to the relief work their their place was was basically unhurt by the hurricane but what they did they sheltered the workers in the building and in homes and they fed the workers to the best of their ability for weeks and I'm going nailed it you just did exactly what Paul was saying to do in 2nd Corinthians chapter 6 7 and 8 and that concludes our lesson 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 I'm gonna have another beverage here in just a bit and it's not an alcoholic beverage I'm just slurring my words today frankly uh, from time to time I suffer migraines and they mess with my speech it's not a bad one but it's lingering so you know and again don't don't worry about it don't pray that the pain be taken away because fr quite frankly pain has taught me a lot of lessons and how to be kind in my life maybe we'll talk about that sometime have a great week cheers